All right, welcome back to the Krabby Dice. Today we're going to be looking at the game Trois. So in this one, we're going to be nobles of the city trying to collect victory points, yada, yada, yada. The theme doesn't matter. It's a pretty interesting game with a hodgepodge uh, worth of mechanics. There's like worker placement, dice rolling. We're going to be using our dice, dice in different aspects of the game to activate the actions to score the most victory points that we can. All right, so this is going to be the setup and rules breakdown video. Click on the link below if you want to see my review and my full playthrough. Uh, three things before we start. Like usual, please like, subscribe, and comment on my YouTube channel. That'll be fantastic. Let's get started. All right, so let's tackle the setup to Trois. All right, so the first thing you're gonna do, like usual, lay out your game board. It's quite long, so you're gonna wanna sit on the sides over here. Um, the second thing you're gonna wanna do is lay out your character cards on the board, all right? So you're gonna have three different colored decks, and they're each gonna be numbered one, two, and three. So you're gonna have three cards of each. Take one random card from each and place them in these designated spots. Uh, the rest can be thrown back into the game box. All right, on the side of the board, you're going to have your victory point chits, the dice, your money, and also the event dice down here in the bottom left. And the last thing we need to do is take care of the event decks. All right, so you, again, they're going to come in three different colors. You're always going to play with all the white and all the yellow, but for the red, it's going to depend on the player count. So in a three-player game, you are going to be playing with five. Uh, I believe in a four-player game, there's six, and in a two-player game, there's only four. All right. Now, that's pretty much it for the game board. Let's go look at our player board pieces. All right, so this is interesting. You're gonna notice that I do have a player board here. This is downloaded off BGG, um, and I would definitely suggest you print it out because it's really handy. Uh, what you're gonna do is give every single player all the tokens in their color, all right? All the cubes and meeples, all right? You're always gonna be playing with all the cubes. Just put them out in front of you, but your personal supply of meeples is limited, all right? So in a three-player game, you're gonna have five, uh, if you're four players, you're going to have four. And if you're two players, you're going to have six. All right. And the rest of your meeples are going to go into a general supply. If you have a game board like this, put them in your general supply. If not, just keep it in an area next to the game board so that you don't accidentally mix them up with your personal supply. All right. Lastly, give everyone $5. Uh, one of these handy dandy uh, reference sheets. Uh, figure out who first player is and give them this marker. All right. For the game board, each player is going to put one of their discs in a district. This is where your dice are going to sort of live. Um, this is just an indicator of which ones are yours. And finally, each person is going to put a disc on the fourth spot of the influence track. We're all going to start with four influence. All right. So we're pretty much ready to go. Now, before you actually start the game, though, there is a reverse sort of snake draft thing going on to figure out where your initial workers are going to be on the board. All right, so your workers can s go into each of these six dark spaces of the three different colors of the city. All right, so starting with the first player, they're going to put out a worker and then you're going to go to the last player and then the last player is going to play first and go to the first player. And you're going to do this until everyone's played all of their workers from their personal supply. So the workers that you have here. All right, so I'll just show you with an example. So first player is going to maybe go here. And then the second player can decide where he wants to go. So let's say he goes here. Then the third player gets to the side. Let's say he wants to go there. And then you're going to go in reverse order. So third player is going to go. I'm going to simulate a three player game. And let's say green wants to jump in here. And then it will go back to first player who let's say would go over here. All right, and then first player would play. And everyone's going to do this. Uh, let's say he wants to go here. Until everyone's played all their meeples. All right, these spaces might not make any sense right now, what they mean. I'm gonna to explain to you in the rules what they mean, but for right now, you just need to know that we're all placing our meeples to get our starting dice uh, in those uh, areas. All right, and you're just gonna do this until everyone's put out all their dice. Right, let's go here. And then the last die. Uh, let's go for a lot of yellow. Let's say green. Let's get a couple of red. And let's say orange is going for white all right so this is the initial placement the only thing you need to left uh, left to do is for any spots that are still out there unoccupied you're going to use these neutral meeples and you're going to fill them up all right the only exception is in a two-player game you're actually going to start with some neutral meeples on the board and then place your your uh, guys out there but in a three and four player game you're going to place and then after put the neutral meeples after so this is the setup you're pretty much ready to go Let's go to rules. Sorry, one last thing that I forgot. There are your secret objective character cards over here. So before you even do the draft and figure out what your dice is, you're gonna give one to each player face down. They can look at it and figure out what their secret objective is gonna be. Uh, so I'm gonna give one to each player. Then you're gonna put out your workers and then you're ready to go 
uh, start the game. All right, so let's go to rules. All right, welcome to the rules breakdown for Trois. All right, so this is a really weird game to try to explain at a high level because it's got so many different mechanics all thrown in, sort of in a hodgepodge kind of way, but it all works really well. All right, so there's a bit of worker placement, dice rolling, uh, buying other people's dice, set collection, events, a bunch of things going on. But, um, I mean, the main mechanism here, what's going to happen is we're going to be gathering our dice at the beginning of the round and our dice... Our workers are going to dictate which dice we're actually going to get to roll and then you're going to go through a sort of action phase where you're going to be using those dice in different areas like the cathedral, uh, the activity cards, uh, kicking out other people's workers in the three areas and even attacking the events down here at the bottom of the, uh, of the track. All right. The most unique mechanism in this game though is that even though you're rolling the dice and each player is going to roll their own set of dice, those dice don't technically belong to you. Any other player can pay you to use your dice, all right? So don't get married to your dice too much because on other players' turns, they can pay you to use your dice as well, all right? Now, the game is the length is gonna fluctuate depending on the number of players, all right? So if you're two players, you're actually only playing four rounds and then you're gonna play five rounds at three players and six rounds at four players. All right, now each round is broken up into the same five phases and that's how I'm going to break down this video. We're going to go through each of those five phases. I'm going to go into greater detail with all the rules. All right, phase four is the action phase where we're going to be spending most of our time. And then at the end of this video, I'm going to come back and sort of go over all the scoring stuff going on in the game because uh, you sort of want to have a game plan when you're playing on uh, what you're planning to score. But I'm going to teach you that at the end of the video. All right, so let's get started. All right, before going into any of the rules in the game, the phases, the actions, and all that stuff, I'm gonna talk about the way to spend influence because this is something you can do literally at any time in the game, including during uh, the event phase or during the action phase and so on and so on. All right, so you can spend influence here according to your player aid uh, to do one of three things, all right? Uh, the most expensive one is spending four influence, all right? So you're gonna spend four influence and move back on the track and you get to flip up to three dice onto their other side. So if you roll three ones, well, you get to flip them into three sixes. If you roll the one, two, and a three, you'll get a four, five, and a six, for example. All right, and you don't have to do three dice. If you only have two dice, if you roll two ones, you'll turn them into two sixes. All right, the next thing is spending two influence to take back another meeple from the general supply and add it to your personal supply. So for example, remember, I am using a special board here. You're gonna take a meeple from the general supply and add it to your personal supply. All right, if you're not playing with this board, just take it from the general supply that's near the board and add it to your personal supply. And the last thing is re-rolling a die. So you can spend one influence to re-roll a die in your district at any point. So during the events, during your action, you just pay an influence from the track. So move your marker down one, take a die, re-roll it, add it back to your district. And you can keep doing that as many times as you want to try to get the number that you want. Okay, so at the start of a round, uh, you're gonna do three things and you can pretty much all do this at the exact same time, all right? So the first thing is flipping over to the next activity card. So for the first three rounds of the game, you're gonna flip over a card. If you're playing rounds four, five, or six, there's no card to flip over. So in round one, you're gonna flip over all the ones, in round two, all the twos, and in round three, all the threes. So let's just say it's the start of the game here. We're gonna flip over all the one cards. All right, the next thing you're gonna do is collect income, all right? so. The base is 10, but you need to pay for all the workers you currently have out there. So your red dice, as you can tell from here, are gonna cost $2 each. Uh, the white dice are gonna cost one die each, and the yellow ones are actually free. All right, so in this example here, blue has two dice here, which is equal to four, and then his other three are here, which is zero. So he's gonna get 10 minus four, he's gonna get $6 in total, take from the general supply, and add it to his personal supply. All right, green on the other hand, is gonna have to pay four, five, six, so he's only gonna net four, and he's gonna add it to his personal supply. And orange is gonna have to pay two, three, four, five, so he's gonna net five and add it to his personal supply. All right, when everyone got their cash, you're gonna get your dice, all right? So now you're actually gonna collect for where your workers are, and that's why you wanna have workers out in this district. So blue is gonna get two red dice and three yellow dice. All right, they're gonna roll them. And then after you roll your dice, you always add them into your district. All right, so now green's gonna get one yellow, two white and two red you can give this a good roll add it to his district and then orange is going to get three white a red and a yellow 
and there you go. So that's the end of the, sort of the first three phases of the game. All right, uh, phase three, after taking all your dice, is the event phase. All right, this is where we're gonna be focusing on the track at the bottom of the board right over here. All right, so every single round, you're gonna flip over two cards from the event cards over here. Always one red card, and then the red card is gonna tell you which of the other two colors you're gonna add to the queue at the bottom. All right, so for example, we're gonna flip over the first one, and it says add a yellow card. So you're gonna add this to the queue, and then you're gonna add also a yellow card. All right, after performing this, there can be multiple cards. If there's the first round of the game, obviously you're only adding two cards here to the second and third spot. And then you're gonna activate all the cards uh, that don't have a black die. We're gonna get to that in a couple of seconds. All right, and those are sort of events that are gonna affect all the players. All right, some of them affect each player individually. Some of them will affect the cathedral. Some of them affect the three sort of areas. Some of them have black dice, so on and so on. All right, so in this example here, each player needs to pay three coins back into the general supply. All right, when dealing with these type of event cards, if you're forced to pay something, for example, influence or money, and you don't have that resource, you pay as much as you can, then you're gonna lose two points. You're gonna lose two victory point chits and toss them back into the general supply. All right, once everyone's taking care of the uh, global events here, you're gonna look at the black dice. So the black dice are gonna come and attack us. So you're gonna look at the total sum of all the black dice. So in this example, it's two. You're gonna roll those dice, and now starting with the first player, we're gonna have to deal with these black dice. I like to call these Marauder dice, and that's what I'm gonna call them for the rest of this video. All right, so each player, when it's their turn, must face off against the highest value currently available. All right, but you're not forced to just stop at that die. You can actually fight more than one die if you wanted to. So you can, if there's five dice out there, you can fight the highest one and the lowest one at the same time. All right, and the way this works is, let's say blue is the first player, you need to give up a die to fight that die, and the die you give up is of equal or higher value, all right? So I can either give up the six here, or give up a two and a three, all right? You can give up a combination of dice equal to that value. Now, what's special about this phase is red dice are actually doubled, all right? So this five is actually a 10, and this four is actually an eight. So for example, I could give up my five, and actually fight off both of these dice at the exact same time. Or I can give up my six and just fight off the six so that the next player has to give up a die to fight off the four. All right, the reward for fighting off a die, all right, so for example, let's say I give up my six and I fought off of the, the five die. By fighting off a die, you're gonna gain an influence on the track. All right, and then it'll go on to the next player. This phase completely ends when all the black dice are totally gone. All right, so it's possible uh, that uh, all the dice are gone before it gets to your turn. It's fine. You're just going to end the phase anyway and move on to the action phase, which is phase four. Just a couple of things to note about this phase. It's very important. Uh, you cannot buy other players' dice to fight off these marauding dice. We're going to talk about buying dice in the action phase. Uh, but in this game, there's a way to use other players' dice. But you cannot do that during this phase. You must use your own dice. All right, second, I already mentioned it, the red dice are actually doubled. So for example, I could have given up my five instead of my six to fight off both black dice, and then I would have gained two influence on the track. All right, again, when all the dice are gone, move on to the action phase. All right, and finally, we're gonna get to the meat of the game, which is phase four, which is the action phase where we're gonna be using our dice to do the many actions that you can in the game. All right, so there's four main actions you can do in the game. Uh, there's using activity card, there's fighting events, there's building the cathedral, and sending your workers to the uh, colored regions here. Uh, there's also a passing action and an agricultural action that I'll mention later on uh, in the video. All right, so let's tackle each of those actions one at a time. So the first thing you can do is send one to three white dice to the cathedral. All right, so for example, if it was orange's turn, they can give up one, two, or three of his white dice to put cubes into the cathedral. So let's just say he went uh, a little on the crazy side and gave up three dice. So here you're gonna see two threes and a five. That was orange, so he's gonna take three of his cubes and he's gonna put two on threes and one on a five. All right, you always place cubes in the cathedral from the bottom working up. If that number is completely filled up, well, too bad, you can't place that number in the cathedral. All right, when placing in the cathedral, you're also gonna look above 
uh, you're gonna gain influence according to where you place cubes. So if you place a one, two, or three die, you're gonna gain one influence for those uh, cubes. And if you put in a four, five, or six, you're gonna gain two influence, all right? Uh, and a point, all right? You also gain a point for each cube. So in this example here, he will gain three points, three points from the general supply, added to his personal supply, and he will gain one, two, three, four influence on the track. All right, so that's the cathedral action. All right, the second thing you can do with your dice is visiting an activity card. All right, so just like the cathedral, you can give up one, two, or three of your dice to activate uh, an activity card, which is essentially just a specialized worker in the city. All right, those are what the activity cards are. So for example, if it was Blue's turn here, they can give up one, two, or three of their yellow dice to activate a yellow activity card, a red die to activate a red activity card, and if they didn't, if they had white dice, they can use white dice to activate a white activity card. All right. So let's just say again, they went crazy and they wanted to send all three activity cards to this uh, artisan card activity card right over here. All right. So the, you got to sort of check two things before activating the card. First, do you have a worker on the card itself? Uh, so it's two situations, yes or no. If you don't have a worker, you need to pay to put a worker in. So the cost of activating that uh, activity card is indicated on top of left over here. So it's gonna cost you $5. All right, so you're gonna to go to your personal supply and pay $5. All right, the next thing you're gonna do is after paying is you're gonna take one of your workers from your personal supply and add it to the card on the next available uh, spot. So the first two sort of workers going on a card are always gonna generate victory points. All right, and after that, you're just gonna add your worker to the card and not gain any victory points, but I was the first one there, so I'm gonna gain two victory points. All right, now, if you need to add a worker and you don't have one in your personal supply, remember from the influence uh, section from before, you can pay two influence, move down twice on the track to move one uh, from your general supply to your personal supply, and then use it on the activity card. All right, now, in the future, when I need to activate this card, I don't need to pay and I don't need to add a worker because that already happened. I just have to use up my dice. All right, so now whether I had to pay or not to put my worker down, you actually activate the ability of the card. All right, so this is where uh, some math comes into play. It's sort of like Stone Age. You're gonna add up the total value that you're using and divide it and that's how many times you're gonna activate the ability on the bottom right. So for example here, let's say I was just giving up two dice here. This is an eight, so I'm gonna use up eight worth of yellow dice or pips and this is a four so eight divided by four is two so i can activate this ability on the right two times and this ability is use up an influence to get six coins so again i would lose two influence and i would gain 12 coins from the general supply and add it to my personal supply All right so there's two types of cards that you can activate in this game if you don't see a um, hourglass on it so this symbol over here it just means activate it at that point and then lose those dice and then you just move on to the next player. Now, in the case where you're actually activating a activity card where there's the, the symbol here on the bottom right, instead of activating the power at that point, you're gonna add that many cubes to the card. So let's say I gave up nine worth of pips to get this card. I'm gonna add three cubes, because three times three is nine, to the card. Now this symbol basically means any time in one of my future actions, I can take back one of these cubes into my personal supply to activate this power. So for example, in a future turn, you can give up one of these cubes from this card to turn one to three yellow cubes, in, uh, sorry, dice into red dice. So simulate that those dice are red. For example, if I want to fight those marauders during phase three, or if I wanted to activate a red card, I can sort of do some kind of conversion. All right, so that's how the activity cards work. All right, the next action is fighting the events where we're gonna again look at the track below over here. So you can give up the amount of dice, one to three, just like in the previous two examples, to fight off the events, but the color requirement is actually written on the event card itself. So the one printed on the board, you can use any colored dice, but the other ones that show up, for example, this one needs yellow dice, and this one needs red dice. All right, so let's say it is uh, Green's turn, and they wanna fight off the event, they can give up one, two, or three dice to fight off the event. So for example, let's say you want to give up two red dice to fight off this event. So just like in the activity section, you're gonna do the mathematical sort of thing. So nine divided by three, it is equal to three cubes. All right, you always round down. And you're gonna add three cubes to the card 
Now, when you add cubes to the card, you always add them to the flags, all right? And the most cubes that can be added to a card are indicated by the number of flags. So the next person, there's no point in giving up a nine uh, divided by three, which is three, because there's only one spot left. You'd want to give up just a three to finish off the card. Now, for every cube that you add to a card, and you're gonna cover up these flags, you're gonna gain an influence point. So in this example here, green put out three cubes, so you would get three influence on the influence track. Okay, and then we'll move on to the next player. Now, if a card gets completely filled up, you're gonna do a couple of things. First, you're gonna divvy up the victory points, and then somebody's gonna gain control of this card, all right, for end game purposes. All right, so, uh, the person with the most cubes is going to get the top number here and the person with the second most cubes is going to get the second number here In case of a tie, you're going to add up both numbers together and divide by two All right, if there's a tie for second place, uh, you're just going to divide by two uh, Round it to the nearest whole number All right uh, If one player completely fills up one whole card by himself you're actually going to gain both numbers uh, in victory point chits. All right, you're going to take them from the victory point chit section over here and add it to your player board. All right, next, the player who has the most cubes is also going to take this card and add it to their player board area. All right, for end game scoring purposes. And in case of a tie, it's the person who added the first cube to the card is actually going to take it. All right, so for example, if two players had two cubes on it, whoever had their cube on the first spot up here uh, will take the card. All right, and that's how this works. You can sort of go on any card you want. You cannot split between multiple cards. So let's say both these cards had red dice requirements. You couldn't give up a set to go on both of these cards. You must pick one card. After fighting an event, divvying up the points and giving the card to the player, any cubes that were on the card get returned back to those player supplies. All right, the next action is placing a worker in one of the three colored regions over here where the workers currently sit. All right, so for this action, you must give up exactly one die. No, no more or no less. All right, and the color of die is going to indicate which of the three sectors you're going to go put your worker. And the number is also in which sort of row you're going to start sliding everyone to the right. All right, the exception is the red. Each spot has a number. All right, but in the case of white and yellow, you're going to slide some of the other players, workers off into the depot section at the end of the track. All right, so I'll show you with both examples. So let's say it was orange's turn. They can give up a red number one. Take one of their available workers. So remember, if you don't have any in your personal supply, you can pay two influence to take a worker and then do the action. So if in this case, you would sort of push off the neutral worker here into the depot area, like I like to call it, and replace it with your worker. All right, and this is the same way for all the three different districts. So for example, if it was Green's turn, uh, they can give up a white five, all right? And they will look at the row for white five and push everything to the right. So in this example here, the neutral worker would fall off and everything would slide over and he would go to the front of the line. All right, in a following turn, he can also give up a white six and push everything over to the right and add another worker in. All right, so that's how the workers sort of move around on the board. I'll show you with another example. Let's say blue gives up a three. Blue can take one of their available workers, look at the three row and just push things over and put in their worker. Now there's a very, very, very important rule when performing this slide type of action. If a person or a player already has their colored meeple in the depot area, for example, if somebody in that turn would push off the uh, blue uh, player's worker off over and then this would slide over and let's say replace it with a green. Let's give you a random example. Now nobody else would be able to use any of their yellow dice to push off a blue worker into the depot because blue already has a worker in the depot. So it'd be impossible to give up a one, two, three, four, five or six yellow because that would cause another blue worker to fall off into the depot. So remember, at most one player's color can be in the depot. All right, so in this example over here, we would be able to still add a green one to the depot, but the orange or green would not be able to follow afterwards. All right, so this is the same rule for all three districts. 
All right, so the next action is actually printed out on the board and it's the agriculture action right over here. So just like the first three actions, you can give up one, two or three yellow dice divided by two and get that many coins from the general supply. So in this example here, let's say I gave up 14. I would do 14 divided by two, seven. I would take seven coins from the general supply and add it to my personal supply. All right, and the last action to talk about is actually passing. All right, so whether you have dice or not, all right, you can pass if you still have dice in your district. Uh, but if you pass, you're out for the round. You cannot take any more actions. And how you indicate that you're out for the round is you're actually going to take two coins from the general supply and add it to your district. All right, that means you've passed. All right, the second thing that's going to happen is every time it loops back around to your turn and the round's not over, you're actually going to add another coin to the district. All right, so if you've passed early, well, it's possible that the uh, turns are going to fly by you, but you are going to make some money as compensation as other players are taking more actions. All right. And finally, we're going to talk about phase five, which is sort of the round reset and then the round stuff. All right. So there's two ways for the end of round to get triggered. All right. The first way is if everyone passes and the way that you can tell if that happens is basically every single district with a player color is going to have money on it, which basically means we all pass because remember the passing action adds two money to your district. All right, the other way that this gets triggered is if there's no more dice in the city. So in, instead of orange passing, let's say you would have taken a yellow action, like adding two cubes to the cathedral, you would have performed the action. Now that there's no dice in the city, that will also cause the end of round to get triggered. All right, when that happens, all right, you're gonna sort of do a reset. All the money that's in the districts, you're gonna take them back into your personal supply. So blue will get this money here, green will get the money in this district, and so on and so on. After that, the only thing you really need to do is pass the first player marker to the next player on the first player's left. All right, and then you're gonna go on to the next round. All right, and finally, we're gonna talk about the most unique and most complex and the hardest rule to understand in this game. And there's a reason I'm keeping it for the end of this video, which is purchasing other players' dice. All right, so one of the unique aspects of this game is you're not forced to use only your dice when performing an action you can actually use dice of other players and even the neutral players dice when performing an action all right to do so you need to pay that player some money all right if you are using the neutral players dice you're actually going to pay the bank all right so you are given this handy dandy little player aid over here and this is the top section up here now the price per die that you need to pay is not based on uh, how many you're taking from a player it's based on what the group of dice that you're using to perform the action. All right, I'm going to show you with an example because it's a little complex with the wording. But if you're just buying one die off a player and using it uh, as a one die group. So, for example, using one die in the cathedral, or using one die to kick out a worker and replacing with your own worker in one of the three districts or uh, activating an activity card or fighting an event with only one die. Well, then that one die. It's a group of one will only cost you $2. All right, so you just need to pay that player $2, take $2 from your personal supply, give him $2, use his die in the action, move on to the next player. All right now, if you're making a group of two, each die that you buy off somebody is going to cost four. All right, so the bigger the groups you're making in this game, the more you have to pay for the dice. So for example, let's say I wanted to activate the yellow activity card over here and I'm the blue player. Um, I would have to pay, let's say I want to buy one yellow die off the neutral player here to make a group of nine. I would have to pay the bank, which is the neutral player, $4 because I'm actually using a group of two to do an action. All right, so this works if I'm doing an event, the cathedral, or an activity card. You have to pay the groups of two. Each die is $4. So for example, if I use both neutral player's dice, I would have to pay him eight or pay the bank eight and then I would be able to use both of the dice uh, available. All right, you can even split it. So I can use one die off one player and one off the neutral. I would have to pay $4 to orange and $4 to the bank, but then I would get to use both of these dice. All right, and the same thing works with uh, groups of three. All right, but then each die is gonna cost you $6. So let's say I'm blue and I wanna use oranges uh, six here and then the neutral players two. So I did make a, a crazy amount of pips here which is 14 but I am making a group of three I'm gonna have to pay the orange player six dollars 
for these for that one die and then i'm gonna have to pay the bank which is the neutral player another six dollars so that's twelve dollars in total because i'm doing a group of three and i'm pay paying for two dice all right you never pay for your own dice obviously because they're yours all right and that's how purchasing dice works so in this game on your turn if you're using other players dice always look at this chart if you're buying one die it's going to be two dollars if you're buying one die for a group of two it's going to be four dollars if you're buying a die for a group of three it's six dollars per die so that's how this works all right and finally we're going to talk about end game and end game scoring so like i mentioned in the overview which seems like a while ago uh the last round is going to be the round when the red event deck completely runs out so when the last card is put into the queue that's going to be the last round of the game. After everyone's performed the actions for that round, you're going to go to end game scoring. All right. So for end game scoring, you're going to score five things. All right. The first thing is all the points that you've collected during the game still count. That's one. All right. Second, you're going to add all the meeples where you have on activity cards. They're all going to have point scoring uh, markers underneath. You're going to add those points. So for example, here, if I was here, here and here, I would score two, two and three extra points. All right. Add that to your total. All right, if you have a worker uh, where it was the third or fourth worker on an activity card, they would score you zero points, obviously, because they're not on the point spaces. All right, after that, you're going to get minus points for the cathedral. So the way this works is for every row that you don't have a cube, you're going to lose two points. So in this example here, green and blue will lose six points and orange will lose two points. All right, after that, you're going to go look at the events. So for every event card that's not been fought off at the end of the game, each player that has a cube on a card will get one point. All right, so in this example here, it doesn't matter if blue has more than one cube on this card, it's still one point. So blue will get three points, all right, because the one printed on the board does count, and green will get only two points. All right, and finally, we're going to talk about your final end goal objective character card. So each player was given one of these at the start of the game, and this is sort of an end game objective you're trying to achieve but it counts for all the players all right so during the game you sort of want to track what the players are doing because it might give you a hint on what their hidden objective is because you're going to score it too so for example for this one it's for all the uh event cards that you sort of have in your sort of tableau because you uh ended up fighting them off uh, you're going to score extra points so here if you only have one you're going to get one point if you fought off three cards you're going to get three points and if you fought off five you're going to get six so let's say i as the player with this card fought off five i'll get six points and let's say green fought off three he would get three points but let's say orange fought off only one he would get one point and you're going to check for all the other cards and the cards all sort of work in similar way this is for your influence so you're going to look at where you are on the influence track and score that many points but each player is going to do it remember there's one for money one for workers on the board many different things all right when you do that total sum after those five things that you're going to check whoever has the most points is going to win the game of trois all right so those are all the rules and how to score click on the link below if you want to see my review and the full playthrough i hope you enjoyed it we'll see you in the next one later